Hi there, welcome to the Young Viral Lecture. I can see people joining. The attendees number is rising as we are. Um, I'm Fran and I work at the Royal Entomological Society. In my background, you can see our giant leaf cutter ant sculpture that we have at our society headquarters just north of London. Um, so good afternoon from the UK if you're in the UK. Good morning if you're in the USA or good evening if you're somewhere else in the world. Um, just wanted to say welcome. This is a new event for us. Um, I also wanted to highlight one of the initiatives that our society does actually with a different organisation um, called the Great Bug Hunt. Um, so if you are primary aged in the UK, that is ages about five, seven to 11, we have a competition you can get involved with called the Great Bug Hunt. So do have a look for that online or maybe your parents can look, look at it for you and that's something you can get involved with. So I'm now going to hand over to our society president, Helen. Hi, Helen. Hi, it's wonderful to be here and um, to be representing the Royal Entomological Society as their, their current president and um, so exciting to be alongside the Amateur Entomological Society and these partnerships are so important coming together and all of us being part of this amazing entomological community. It's, it's really wonderful and I know that we're in for a really fun afternoon. So I'm just going to say please visit our website and take a look at Insect Week because there's lots of activities that we have there that are ongoing but also there'll be even more posted up through the year so do do visit us and do get in contact with us and I'm looking forward to doing even more things alongside the Amateur Entomological Society but I'm particularly looking forward to the magic of this afternoon that I know that Erica and Victoria are going to share with us so thank you on behalf of the Royal Entomological Society for inviting us along this afternoon. Um, hi, uh, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm a trustee and membership administrator for the Amateur Entomologist Society. Uh, just a little bit of information about us for those who don't know or aren't members. Uh, we're a small charity run by entirely by volunteers uh, based in the UK, but we do have uh, volunteer um, members worldwide. Uh, we have a junior section called the Bug Club, which caters for young people interested in insects and other invertebrates ages between five and 15 and publish journals and range of books, um, including those for young people. And during non-pandemic pandemic times, we have a various um, person events, including the largest insect fair in the UK held at Kempton Park Racecourse, and various events for young people, including our bug club camp, where they can stay over for a weekend and do lots of entomology. Um, but this is the first time we've had an online event, and we're very grateful for the Royal Entomological Society for hosting us. So let me introduce you to our current president, uh, Dr. Erica McAllister. Um, Erica is senior curator of Flies and Fleas at the Natural History Museum in London. It was actually at the Natural History Museum in London at a um, amateur entomologist event. I first met Erica, it was back, way back in 2010. And uh, at the time I was just trying to decide what group of insects I'd really like to get into. And there was the option of going with Erica on a tour of the flies or Max Barkley on a tour of the beetles. And I decided to go with Erica and was just completely smitten by flies. And I've been <laughs> a big fan of them ever since. So uh, Erica has written two best-selling books on flies and is a regular on television and radio. And most recently, Channel 5's Natural History Museum, World of Wonder and Metamorphosis, How Insects Transformed Our World, her own radio series on radio, BBC Radio 4. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Erica. Good afternoon, everyone. So yes, my name is Erica McAllister and I'm very lucky to actually, well, when I'm not working in my shed, which I am now, uh, working at the Natural History Museum in London. And this is a place that everyone kind of knows for its bones and its stones, its dinosaurs, it's all very exciting for that. But that's like, yeah, whatever. That's, so that's very interesting. But the most important animals are obviously the flies. Now, I love flies and I love them because I've been able to study them for a long time and look at them and truly understand them that you got to. We're very lucky in the collection to have approximately between two and a half, three and a half million specimens. Uh, they are, as a guess, you can come and have a count if you want. I'll tell you why, because I've got jars on my desk 
jars of flies that have got loads and loads of little ones in. So we're not quite sure how many we've got. Well, we've got an awful lot of important ones. Up here, you can see some of the silly flies. There's a fly here that's grown horns out the side of its head. I mean, this is just one of the many examples of how they're quite bonkers. But the collection goes back a very, very long time. In fact, that fly in the bottom hand corner, that actually is from 1680 from Hampton Court. That is a royal fly. So this was caught by the gardener at Hampton Court. And because he was a botanist, he pressed it as he would a plant in a book. And it is sat there for hundreds of years. It's come to the collection and now we have it. And it is perfect in colour. And we're able to have like proper data associated with this fly from hundreds of years ago. And many of you might be able to see this fly because it's a very large fly in the UK, in the south of the UK, very important fly. So to help me build the collection and look after the collection, I go around the world. Really amazing tropical field sites, absolutely beautiful, including this, a pigsty from Hounslow. Yeah, I mean, it's not all glamour, I have to admit. I'm, I'm not the, I, you know, uh, there's sometimes I'm, I'm hoovering from Vietnam, from caves and some beautiful desert, uh, deserted beaches in Dominica. But yes, this is me vacuum cleaning flies off a pig. So, I admit that they have a bit of a bad press, flies, because a lot of the things they do is that a little bit, a lot of, a few of the species, sorry, have got some quite weird habits. And I saw this today, and basically this is it, isn't it? When it comes to insects, they fall in that group that we don't like. We all love the ladybirds, and it's quite funny that we've got Helen here, because she is a ladybird champion. And all the rest of them, including two of my fly species there, are just not liked by many people. And to be fair, some of them do hang around some quite disgusting to us habitats. Yes, I've given you a photo of a fly on some poo. And some of them we know are very bad, actually. Some of them transfer uh, many diseases. And it's not the disease themselves, that they're, they're, it's not the mosquito themselves, but the disease they carry. So they're being used as carriers to transmit all the really bad things, such as malaria. So here's a nice female, it's only the female because she's a mother and she needs the blood meal for the eggs and she, here she is taking some of her egg developing substance, our blood. So a lot of people don't like flies at all, they're not cute, they're not like the butterflies, they're not fluffy like the bees, oh but some of them are. Some of them are absolutely adorable and some of them have the most little fluffy coats etc and they're definitely worth studying. So what do I mean by a fly? Well, I'm going to tell you what makes a fly a fly and then I'm going to say but many of them will lie to you because that's the problem with insects. There's a lot of lies in nature in an amusing way. So here we go. They've all got one pair of wings. They've all got a pair of balancing organs which we call halters and they've all got sartorial mouth parts. Now all three of those statements was incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> because some of them don't have wings and some of them don't have halters and some of them don't have mouth parts, especially as the adults. And so the whole thing about flies is I describe them as some of the most plastic of insects. It's like they've taken that little blueprint, they've taken what we've been told is a fly and they laughed at it. Now flies are amazing because they go through this complete life cycle. So what you see is the adult, which uh, the larval stage, which many of us would call the maggot stage, but this is not always the case with flies. And they go through these changes in their life to the pupil stage. And this is the hidden stage where they go through a complete organization change. So basically they come from this quite lazy teenager, as we can affectionately describe it, into this tiny little adult that's out there and wants to get out, it wants to mate, it wants to eat, it wants to disperse, it wants to do all sorts of things. And in having very different life stages, they're able to exist in very, very different environments. For example, who doesn't love these little cuties? Yes, these are the larval stage of a crane fly. And so you can find these in your garden, you could just dig up some roots, you could have a look at them. But what you're seeing here aren't the cute little adorable faces that you think they are. No, you're looking at its bottom. And again, this amuses me that we can identify many species of these fly by looking at their bottoms. 
Because fly, the larval stage is really good. Not only does it separate itself from the adult stage, so it completely feeds on different things. It is able to actually change which bits of its body I use for what part, as it were. So when I eat, I breathe and eat through the same hole. But when they eat, they breathe from the, they eat from the head end. And when they breathe, they breathe from the bottom end. And this has enabled them. So those what they look like as eyes, they're actually breathing spiracles. So they're able to get into some really quite disgusting, well, what we would consider disgusting habitats. You know, I talked about doing tropical field work. Yep, here I am again. <laughs> and this time I'm on the Isle of Scilly. And I'm, yes, indeed, I'm photographing piles of cow pats. And I have to say that by the, uh, by the half an hour I was doing this, I had lots of people come over to me and several people actually joined me and lay down to watch what I was going, doing on the cow pack. So there's lots of fly larvae that feed on poo. And it's disgusting in many ways, but we need it because we need them to get rid of the poo because otherwise those cow pats will build up everywhere. So it's really important that we get in there. And so this is one of the many functions because the little maggots, all they want to do is feed. They're really, really good. I mean, they don't all just hang around cow pats. That's the whole thing. They're not all dirty. They're not all, in fact, they're not dirty at all. And a lot of them are actually quite good predators. So, you know, when you see those David Attenborough documentaries and they've got amazing cats running after things and killing everything. And I'm like, wait, hold on a minute. What about a hoverfly larvae? Because they're way more important when it comes to predators. Here you go. Here's one. And this is a giant, giant hoverfly. And what we can see here is that actually this little hoverfly larvae, and these are living in your garden. You go out and have a look at them. What is amusing is some of them do look like bird poo. It's excellent camouflage. But it's caught an aphid here. And this aphid is like, oh no, oh no, I'm dying. And to tell all of its siblings, and they may be all clothes, they may be all like females of it, uh, sisters of this aphid, it will release this distress pheromone, this distress chemical. And it, it's like, it releases it to tell all of the, its relatives near and dear to it. But the hoverfly larvae, as you see here, starts to raise itself up. And in doing so, it raises the aphid above the heads of the others. So this chemical swathed this cloud of like distress calls have passed over the tops of many of the other aphids. So this little hoverfly larvae is happy to carry on munching away. And this might seem quite bad, but actually in a garden or on our crops and things like that, we really do need this. It helps us not to spray all the bad chemicals that we don't want because these little uh, predators are a nice biological control agent. That's not all the larvae do though. There's some other predaceous larvae that basically can glow, which, come on, that is quite funky. So these, again, these are uh, very vicious predators. <laughs> they are tiny little glowworms. Uh, and these are a type of fly glowworm, not a beetle glowworm. And these can be found in America, but the more famous ones are found in New Zealand. And you can go on holiday my mum has annoyingly been, and I haven't, to these caves where you can see a lot of where these larvae live. And what they do, as you can see on the left, uh, and a diagram of it on the right, is they dangle down little uh, beads. Now these beads aren't nice beads. No, no, no. They're packed with poison. And so when that little moth flies to it going, oh, look at the pretty light, look at the pretty light, it hits the bead and, and it just dissolves. Brilliant. And so this, and it's attracted to the light, which is basically made by that larvae's kidneys. So they don't have a, it's not quite the same as human kidneys, but they do have to filter out a lot of the uh, uh, used, used material in them. And they do it by these little malphigian tubules, their kidneys, but their kidneys glow, which is very cool. So they use them to attract the prey to their death. So the larvae stage does a lot of eating. But it's the adult stage that we know lots and lots about and we see more often than not. Now look, here we go, here's some fantastic flies. Now the thing is about flies is they have to fly, obviously, most of them, but they have to be able to see really quickly what's going on. Because they, if you imagine going at speed, if you didn't spe uh, see what was going on, you'd run into walls. I am permanently walking into trees because I'm not paying any attention. 
And so what they have to do is make sure they take a lot of images very quickly and process them. Now, I'm hoping that none of you have tried to swat a fly. But if you did, you'd find that it's quite hard. Because if you look here on this photo, you will see tiny hundreds of thousands of little cells. Those are photosensory cells. They're like photo units. Imagine each one is a camera. Now, dragonflies have basically about 36,000 cameras, as it were, on their head. And flies, at the most, have about six or seven cameras. But within each camera, it's split into seven more cameras. So they can take lots of different angles and they get really sharp image, which basically, when they process it in their brain, means they see a lot faster than us. So we are basically like from a very slow motion, like action film going, no, as we go towards them. And they're like, oh, what's that crazy human did? I just move out the way. So if you do want to catch a fly, just go really slowly because they don't realize what's going on. Some of the little predators, here's another one with great eyes. They're venomous. OK, so this one is a beautiful flyer. It's a robber fly. You can see it's quite small but it packs a punch because this has venoms new to science. It's great. It's highly venomous. They don't hurt us. You'll be glad to know or sad to know, but they can actually do some real damage to other insects and spiders and some birds. Some of their eyes aren't just used for seeing. No, because flies are flirty and they use them for flirting with each other or sometimes headbutting each other. So these are stalkeyed flies, of which there's quite a lot of them. And the males will, like deer, go up to each other and start judging each other who's got the longest stalks. And if they're quite similar, a lot of them will actually fight. So afterwards, go and have a look on YouTube because it's hours of fun. But they don't just have that. This one, look, it's got antlers. So again, they will do that. And some of them are just weird. This one's got a bright red head. Why it's got a bright red head? When they originally discovered it, they said it glowed in, the, uh, glowed in the dark, which is an absolute lie, because it doesn't at all. But still, it has this amazing red head. We know flies uh, a lot because they have sartorial mouth parts, yeah? And so this one is huge. Again, sadly, it doesn't live in the UK. This one is... And if we had a tongue, as long as that tongue, our tongue would be six metres long. Can you imagine? And what is even funnier is they can't curl it up. It's not like a moth or a butterfly that can curl it up nicely. These have to just fly along with it out the back of them, which is extraordinary. So when they come up to a fly, they have to put their mouth part into position, like manoeuvring a giant straw to be able to go into the flower. We've got some in the UK, they're slightly smaller. These are the bee flies. And again, they've got really nice long mouth parts. And these are the ones just about to come out now. So this is spring. You should all go out into your garden and have a look for these fluffy flying narwhals. They're quite adorable. But I think these ones are adorable. So here we go. We're moving on to some talk about uh, ones without mouth parts. So this little fluffy teddy bear, well, its larvae did all the eating. So when it was a larvae, so it didn't have to do it as an adult because this is a bot fly. And I know a lot of you won't appreciate bot flies as much as I do. I've even got a, a maggot on my desk at home, but they are quite fun. And some of them, that one, lives in the nostril of a camel or a reindeer. But look, something quite disgusting for you. This was found in my friend's arm. So this is a little maggot. Doesn't it look cute? Can you imagine the baby photo pictures of this? Prize baby photos. And it, 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 but sadly, he didn't let it rear out because if he had let it grow into an adult, he would have got something looking like this. And this is an American I know. And he was so happy when he got a bot fly. He reared it out and made a blog about it. So he described all the different processes. It's not for the faint hearted everyone. And I can see some parents probably having a massive fit of me suggesting we all get a bot fly. But when I get one, I'm going to show everyone what's going on and look at the beautiful adult. So the head bit is the eyes, the mouth, the senses, the brain, and the antennae are also used for listening. With the antennae, the parts of the front, some of them have got loudspeakers and hearing aids in their shoulders. So on here, I don't you see that big hole 
that circle there. Now that's a spiracle to enable it to breathe, but below it, you can see what looks like a satsumus, uh, an orange segment. And that is a hearing aid. And that is able to amplify the noise from its environment. And what we're doing now is we're developing tiny little loudspeakers based on this three millimeter long fly to enable us to hear long distances away. But flying is what they're all known for. And here we go, here's one of the best flyers, it's the hoverflies. And they really are really good flyers. Um, they can loop the loop, they can fly backwards, land upside down and hover. And this is truly rare. We, there are many, uh, there are some mammals that do it, obviously some birds that do it, but very, very few when it comes to it. Now there's thousands of hoverflies, they're great. And they are, it's not the only flies that do it, but they're the ones we've been studying. And we're properly studying them because we're making robots that mimic them. And annoyingly, most of these are called robies. And it's again, why do bees get all the love and attention when they're based on flies? And so here you are, these are our one pair of wings for this robot and they've got uh, an antennae. So they're able to stabilize themselves. And it's the size of like a five cent koi in this one. So they're tiny little flying robots. And what's great is these robots can get into all sorts of weird places. They're even going into space. So we are sending little miniature robots that look like flies into space, which always amuses me. You've got some other big wings one. Here you go. This has got really, really long antennae, but you've also really huge wings. And they use, again, their wings for flirting. But it's not just flirting with flies. Some of them will use them for defence. So here we go. This is a, a, a fruit fly here, a proper fruit fly. And you may not see it. You probably have to turn your head slightly sideways, but they mimic jumping spiders, okay? So when they land, they put their head right down and their wings and their bottom right up in the air. And it basically looks like a tiny aggressive spider rearing up. And this is enough to defend itself against spiders and ants, which are trying to eat it. So there's lots of examples where they've got little patterns on their wings to enable them to look like things they're not. There's another very closely related species to this that themselves, they've got what looks like ants on their wings. So when the ants come along, the ants are like, oh, I'm not going over there. There's an aggressive female ant over there. We've got to leave her alone. So amazing adaptations to their wings. But as I said, not all of them have wings. Here you go. This is probably my favourite image at the moment because I, I just get too excited. This is a fly. It's quite a big fly. I think you can see, <laughs> but it's quite a small bat. And these are basically, they've got rid of their wings. They've got rid of their halters. Uh, their head is greatly reduced and they're feeding on the blood of a bat. So they're running around. They look a bit like a drunk spider. I've collected these off bats in the Caribbean and they are completely living on her. If you look closely at the legs, you can see the claws and these claws are completely adapted to holding onto the fur of these bats. And I think these are amazing, not only because they look really funky, but because these are nurturing mothers. So these flies get pregnant. They will actually internally rear their little maggots. Isn't that cute? And what they do is the mother, once the maggot, when she's about to give birth, she quickly rushes off the bat and then she finds the wall of the cave or the tree or wherever she is to give birth. And this little like wriggling little maggot, immediately it hits fresh air, it pupates. And so it hardens into this, this case over it. And her final act of mothering loveliness is that she rears back onto this slightly hardened case to wedge it onto the surface. So she kind of makes sure it's glued onto whatever the surface it is, which is cool. So it's really, really amazing adaptation going on with these flies here. But what we've got um, with these bat flies is one of the most extreme examples of body form change that you're possibly ever likely to see. And it's this one. Now, I'm just gonna let you look at this for a second because it just looks really weird. Looks like a spiky smiley face. And well, I don't know what you'd call that, a pair with a spiky bottom. Now, obviously this is a talk on flies. So you know that this is going to be a fly. Yep. 
What I will tell you, it, it, it was, it did start off basically looking like a fly. Okay. So here it was, and this is a female. Okay. And when she hatched from the pupa and she had wings and she had legs and she was like, yay, I'm a normal fly. And then she had a relationship and she got pregnant as it were, because she really did get pregnant. And after that, she went and found a bat. Now this bat, she was going to live on for the rest of her life. So she had originally a mouth part that was really, really protruded, really stubby. And what she did, she shoved it into the side of the bat. Now, when she'd done that, she was like, right, I'm happy. So she's wedged her head in the side of the bat. She's then ripped her legs off, ripped her wings off and gone, there we go. So she's now just basically a long cucumber stuck in the side of a bat. Oh, not happy with that bit. Her bum, her abdomen, now grows around the rest of her body. <laughs> so she now looks like this weird inverted conical flask. And that little smiley face, yes, that is her bum. So that is the bit that pokes out the side of the bat. So when you see it, and sadly, I've never seen it yet, and I can't wait to actually see this in the live. It's on my hit list of things to do before I die. When you see it, all you do see is this tiny little smiley face poking out. But remember, it's the bottom. A lot of them have got very, very funky legs. OK, so these are there's some females here with the hairy, hairy legs. <coughs> it's a bit like me at the moment. And she will use them to flirt. So she will like wave going, hey, males, look at my hairy legs. And what she does is she wraps them around her abdomen to say, look at my abdomen. I can contain loads of eggs. That's why I'm showing, bringing you attention. But the boys, they've got some amazing adaptations as well. And this one, he's got very, um, he's got clubs basically on his front tarsi. And what is there is silk glands. And he makes silk. And he does this because he gives the female gifts. So this is very much like giving presents to your loved ones. And uh, what he would do often is that some of these flies will give balls of saliva, which doesn't sound particularly pleasant, but a lot of them will wrap up dead animals, dead insects in their silk to give them lovely, beautiful gifts. Isn't that romantic? Now, we have some amazing adaptations going on with bristles. So this is all the outside of, of the exoskeleton. And they also release chemicals. So all insects do this. They release chemicals. We do it. We have a certain smell. And the thing about flies is this, uh, and with all insects, is this changes over time, changes on the sex, changes on all sorts of things. But it also enables the skin to be water repellent. So in the UK, we have lots of diving beetles. We're very used to that. We, we know that. But in California, there's a fly that dives. And so you can see it here. It's created a plastron, this uh, air breathing bubble. And this woman, this female, sorry, has dived down. She's a scuba diving dive. She's dived down to the bottom of the lake where she's going to lay her eggs, her larvae. Now, I think what's amazing about this is have a look. Check out the eyes. The eyes haven't been covered up. So it's like she can see properly underwater. Now, you may not think this is amazing because it's like, hey, there's water beetles there. What are you talking about? Well, the thing is, there's such high salinity that nothing else can exist. Water beetles are their way in because there's so much salt in the water. It disrupts this bubble, air bubble they've got, and makes it disappear. So they were basically drown. But she, thanks to her chemicals, thanks to her bristles, has created this impenetrable boundary, barrier to enable her to get to areas that basically nothing else can get in there. So this gets rid of all the predators. So there's so much de uh, decaying animals and plant matter in there that it could feed the larvae. And so, but they can do it with like freedom. They don't have to worry about being attacked. What an amazing thing. Not as amazing as some of the bottoms of these creatures. I, I love a flat bot fat bottom fly. Who doesn't like anything with these? I describe them as the Kim Kardashian of the fly world. Massive bottoms. Why she's got a bottom that's wider than the rest of her. Can you imagine if that was a human? I'm just saying. And she's adored for it. Absolutely. It shows that she's going to be really good at taking uh, at producing lots of eggs. Because some flies can produce thousands of eggs. 
So here's my final little story of this quick little walkthrough of all the flies. Now, this is quite amazing because these are our family of flies that occur all around the world. We even have three of them in the UK, but sadly ours aren't quite as cute and adorable as some of these here. Now, these are spider killing flies. Love it. I think you can tell what they do. So when everyone talks about uh, all the spiders killing the fly, I'm like, no, 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 hold on a minute. There's some flies that kill spiders. Now, these are also called hunchback flies. I think you can see why. Now, they're amazing. So there's some, look, you can see there with amazing antennae that look like paddles. Why they have got this antennae, we don't know. They've also, not just their amazingly big wings, there's a bit on the wing called, uh, below the wing, sorry, called a squamer or calyctor. And they've got huge ones. So you can see them at the base of the wing. We don't know what that does. We genuinely haven't a clue. We can make some guesses, but we don't know. And that's the thing. There's still so much about flies and other insects and science in general. We still don't know. We need to do some research. But a lot of them have very, very long mouth parts. You can see here, uh, especially that beautiful metallic one, because they're very important pollinators. So the adults will go around and they will be able to get into plants with very long tubes and they were able to pass the pollen around. So they're really important adults. But that's not the fun bit. No, the fun bit is the larval stage. Now, the female, she basically has a submachine gun for an egg laying tube. OK, she basically thighs off. She's not like that previous one that really nicely looked after its little larvae. Nope, not this mother. This mother is more like my mother. So what she did, she lays 2000 eggs. It's a huge number. She just fires off them willy nilly around the garden. Can you imagine? Da, 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 da. That is basically what she's doing. And she does she needs a lot of them because a lot will die. Because these little larvae, when they're hatched, they've got no legs. They kind of got a little sucker on and they're like there, hopefully on a plant, hopefully being able to look down because they are trying to get inside a spider. Now, most of you will obviously know spiders quite fast. OK, and the ones these that are after are quite fast indeed. So like uh, wolf spiders and other fast active ground spiders. So you've got this little larvae wiggling around there. Ah! where's my where's my prey where's my food where's 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 who's gonna look after me and it spots the spider and it hurls itself after the spider and <laughs> you've got this wriggling maggot trying to get as fast as possible chasing this very fast active spider now most obviously will fail at this point but if some succeed what they do is they run up the back of the spider and the spiders are different to flies in the fact that they have a very primitive box lung a lung like we to breathe and so they're in their bottom, they have this. Now, what the little maggot does is it crawls up to where this is. And why it does this is genuinely the most remarkable thing ever. Because if the spider is immature, and some may live for five years, 20 years, the, the fly is not happy. And so what it does is it, it, it screws itself in, remember, with its little breathing spiracle, its bum, to the lung, and it is able to fall asleep but still get some oxygen thanks to the spider's lung system. And what it does, it will wait till the spider's developed and then it wakes up. How? We don't know. We're presuming some chemical. And then it starts grazing on the spider <laughs> and then it eats it. And it's like, ah. Now, sometimes you only get one maggot to one spider, but sometimes you get a lot. And these very shiny ones, they live in tarantulas which is amazing, these tiny little flies taking down tarantulas. So the thing I love about flies is that you get this huge variety of form, huge variety of shape, but you get a whole lot of silliness associated with it. So thank you very much. That's a very short little talk, but hopefully it's introduced you to some of the wonders that are flies. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Ah, that was wonderful, Erica. Thank you. I'm so glad I chose flies every beat. <laughs> <laughs> I love Sorry, flies. Ellen. <laughs> oh, we've had some great questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, with a good one here. Um, is um, Helen Wheatley's asking? 
think is there a good illustrated book about, about flies and Ooh, i can think of, right. i can think of a couple yeah i can <laughs> but definitely think of some others as well <laughs> well if you're based in the uk you're in a very fortunate place because we've got a fly society a whole society dedicated to just flies called the diptress forum and the Diptress Forum not only um, help you uh, with loads of identification, but there's lots of images and there's lots of books as published both through the Diptress Forum and the Amateur Entomology Society. So some nice ones is the uh, Soldier Flies, because there's some really pretty pictures in that. Uh, there's really good books, The Wild Guy's Keys to Hoverflies. And what I didn't do, which is very annoying, because it's in my bedroom being read at the moment, is new publication on blue bottles and blow flies, uh, which is a great thing. So there's lots of books, there's lots of information, there's lots of insect books, but they're, oh, look, Fran's got it. There you go. But there's uh, there's all sorts of online keys as well to help you. Oh, that's great, yes. Uh, so uh, picking up on one of the uh, um, flies covered in your talk, Alan Kench asks, can if the glow in the dark larvae hurt people? I don't think so. Um, I haven't heard anyone volunteer yet. Um, what they do is they've got they've got the thing is the enzymes they use are are they are dissolving they flesh dissolve so they they do dissolve the little moths. So I wonder, and obviously I'm not advocating this because it's terrible. If you get enough of it, whether it would do any damage to humans. So in in much the same way that you get the recluse spiders and they have flesh, their enzymes, their digestive enzymes dissolve our flesh. It may happen that we can use this. Now this may seem terrible, but actually we're using a lot of these things actually for medicine. So we can actually get rid of like bad flesh and, 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 and awful things going on by starting to use the chemicals that these insects and other arthropods have. Oh, that's great. We've had also a couple of people ask what fly is your favourite, but also, mm. uh, which is a, oh, that's a very hard question, but also mm. there's a nice one here. Is if you came back as a fly, what sort of fly would you oh. like to come back as? <laughs> okay, I'm totally, oh, would I? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I quite like the idea of the, if I survived, I quite like the idea of living in a spider. Because yeah. um, I quite like the idea of spending most of my life eating. OK, this is where humans get it so wrong, because the fly's life cycle predominantly is the larval stage, as with a lot of insects. And this is the stage all they do is eat. Now, can you imagine just being given food continuously for most of your life? No working, just eating. And then I'm running around in the bottom of a spider, which is quite funky. I, I quite like the idea of doing that. I'm quite lazy. <laughs> uh, that also um, answers Alan Kench's question about does the spider eating larvae actually eat the spider? Which of course they do. Yep. And, <laughs> and related to that, um, Niall asks, what if the fly gets stuck in the spider web? Yeah, um, well, most of them don't go to those sorts of spiders. They're not on orb spiders, but uh, they, they're on the ground running spiders. Um, so they don't, but there, um, there are some that have got stuck leaving. So you do see like sad scenes, of, well, a dead spider with a dead fly associated with it. So there's things like that. But uh, this is very much nature. It's a, it's a whole thing. And then something will probably come along and eat them. So it all gets recycled in the end, although I get a bit like. <gasps> uh, and continue the theme of, of what flies eat. Um, Toby, age eight, asks if there are any flies that feed on trees. Yes, my favorite. Well, there's OK, there's a huge fly. In fact, do you know what? I might even have it here because that's what entomologists do. They have packages of flies on their desk. And this is found in South America. And these flies look very much like horse flies as adults. They scare people, okay? And they're big and they, you know, uh, oh no, I haven't got it. Oh, that's a shame. They scare people, but it's their larvae which are amazing because their larvae look, uh, look like that. This is a maggot I've made earlier, honestly. And their larvae though are about that big. And they live in trees and they eat the rotting wood of the trees or the, the living flesh of the tree in this case. And so, and apparently you can hear them eating about a meter away. 
because they're such noisy feeders. So there's a whole group of them that will leave uh, that will feed on actual living flesh. A lot of them, though, prefer the decomposing flesh of a tree. Can I call it flesh? The decomposing wood of a tree. Wow, sounds amazing. Um, so uh, a couple of questions here about um, evolution of flies and their history. Uh, so um, where's it gone? Someone asked, what's the oldest recorded flock fossil or amber fly? It's Charlie aged 11 and asking Hi, that. Charlie. Um, we think, well, at the moment, I believe it's about 260 million years old. OK, um, because a lot of the flies don't preserve well, because remember, they're the maggots. So if they haven't made it, there, this flesh kind of dissolves quite easily. So that's the problem. But we are seeing with some. Um, some of them, actually, their head capsules stay behind, which is very useful. That sounds like when, when you die, you leave your head behind. That's them. This is the larval stage. So when they go through all the different larvae, they leave a head capsule, such as the non-biting midges. And we can, we can see those. And all of their head capsules left behind helps us create a thermometer on previous climate change. So we can look at what species is found where and tell you what the climate was like, which is quite amazing. But the oldest ones found in fossils, uh, about 260 million years. There's a beautiful one, um, uh, more recent than that, obviously, found alongside dinosaurs. And it's got an enormous mouth part, and I talk about it in his book. And these are some of the earliest pollinators. So flies are very important. Okay, and also asks um, how long the stalk eyed flies have existed and how long they took to evolve. Well, okay, so those, if, if this was a line of flies from the most primitive to the most advanced, they kind of sit in there. So they're quite advanced. What is odd about stalk eyes is it didn't just evolve once. In flies, it evolved 22 times. So it's like almost like one fly went, oh, Look, look what Jeremy's got. He's got stalk eyes. Why haven't you got them, David? Why ever? And so they've kind of looked at each other and they're trying to judge who wants it because they're so plastic with their genetics. They can change quite quickly. So they can change their morphology and they've done this. So you get some that have the, um, the antennae on the end of the stalks of the eyes and some of them, the antennae are still on the head. So you've got all this variability going on. And in some cases, you even get females with stalk eyes. Maybe she just wanted them as well. Oh, that's great. It's, I was always amazed when I found out they'd evolved so many times. It just seems uh, I know. Well, an but odd it, thing to keep, keep turning it, it, up. <laughs> it, well, it's a brilliant thing. And the problem is when I see them on field work, that's it. That's my field work over. Because <laughs> I'm just, just staring at these silly flies headbutting each other. I love it. It's terrible. <laughs> Okay, so someone asks, um, how many different species of, there are, of, of flies are there in Britain and worldwide? Okay, so what was it? 7,176? 7,000. Like 7, <laughs> something like that. There's just over 7,000 species, or maybe 7,200 species of fly in the UK. We haven't described all of them yet, so keep going. Globally, we've described 165 million. So this is a lot less than described species of beetles or butterflies and moths, but that's because we haven't really been looking. So we know that there's more species of fly in the UK than there are butterflies and moths and beetles added together. So actually we know globally there's a lot more. In fact, there was a horrendous estimate that came out of Canada that just on one family of flies, which are really, really difficult to, est uh, to actually figure out what they are, they estimated globally that that one family had 1.8 million species in it. So that is the same number of described animals on the planet. <laughs> I've got more work to do. <laughs> yes, there's work for many lifetimes with flies. That's exactly. Why, that's why I love them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, actually, Charles Barker asked that if you really had to choose another order of invertebrates to devote your life to, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> or would you go to the well, dark side and study vertebrates <laughs> well see I, I've got a, a real soft spot for Calembola which oh. kind of got slightly demoted out of insects which really upset me uh, but they're lovely and I like the fact that they headbutt each other so I just like the silly stuff uh, but also I've, I've got a soft spot for fleas um, 
I quite like scorpion flies. Don't know. I I don't don't ask me that. <laughs> Yeah, and similarly, uh, what got you so interested in flies? I've already told everyone well, how I got interested in them. How, how did you get interested? Well, I, I love nature. I've always been interested in nature. I didn't know you could be an entomologist when I was little. I had no clue. We didn't have, well, we didn't have the internet. Um, so we had no, you know, you read about it and it seems like a million years away from you. You read in these books about people doing that and you're like, nah. No, because you don't, you don't see people. And then so... Um, I was fascinated, but I didn't, and I used to keep <coughs> dead mammals and, and I got given a microscope very early and things like that. So I, I looked at maggots and I was little and I fell out of trees. So I spent a lot of time on the floor and playing with nature. And then I just focused more and more. So I focused on biology and then at university, I was able to focus on entomology. And then I met a man, a lecturer, who scooped up a pile of insects and went, Erica, that eats that and that lays its eggs in that and that does that. And I was like, oh, I want this job. This is amazing. I can study all sorts of things that are disgusting to everyone else that I love. And during my PhD, I knocked on the door of the Natural History Museum and said, can somebody help me identify all these? And they did. And then I thought, oh, do you know what? That's quite nice, that place, isn't it? So I volunteered for them and I wore them down. And they gave me a job. And it's, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that was it. So it was, uh, I, I never saw no if you see what I mean, it was just, and I didn't know how to go about it. I just kept working at it. And then gradually, it, you know, over the years it paid off. So it was good. Hard work and a lot of fun. Yeah, Lucas would like to know how old you were when you first started liking flies. Or is that too much of a personal question? Yeah, <laughs> never ask a female that. Uh, uh, probably, how old is Lucas? Doesn't Do we say. know? Okay. Um, <laughs> I wasn't really, really young because um, uh, when did I start? No, no, maybe I was quite young. So 12, 13, 14 is when I started really paying attention to the world around me. And I got very, very um, involved with nature and trying to look after it. So we were very concerned then with conservation. And so this is something I have always been really interested. In. And one of the ways you can save the planet is to look after the insects. And the insects are arguably some of the most important creatures on it. They give us our food, they clear up our waste, they do all of that. And once you realise that, I was like, why, can I, why would I want to study a mammal? Why? They're boring. When I've got things that live in bottoms of spiders that can save the planet, you know? <laughs> Uh, you talked about the Natural History Museum. We've got a couple of questions related to that, not directly related to flies. So um, Joanne and Molly ask, are there snails in the Natural History Museum? Yeah, there are. There <laughs> are. There's quite a few people who look after the snail collection. They're lovely people. Um, they, in fact, there's two. One of them, he kind of, he looks after the squids as well. And you would have seen him on TV a lot. And then Andrea, who looks after a lot of the snails. And they're quite obsessed, the pair of them and snails. So it's really nice. Again, there's some nice, good uh, keys to UK snails and things like that. So it's very useful. I studied snails during my water snails, part of my PhD. And um, yes, I had lots of fun trying to identify them all. <laughs> I study land snails and slugs. So I'm rather fond of mollusks. As well. I love <laughs> slugs. I think yeah, slugs get a really bad reputation. And I think they're fabulous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And Harriet, age 12, asks, can she come and spend a day in the Natural History Museum? Oh, I would love to spend a day in the Natural History Museum. Yeah. Oh, we're not allowed back in yet. Um, the thing is, we're, when, when it's normal time, hopefully we can organise for some tours to go on. OK, because um, one of the things we really want to do is to encourage all of you to understand the world around us and we want to show you why we have these collections and how these collections are important and also because you help make these collections so a lot of people give us information on insects and we record it and whatever and we could show you why we need this so yes when we finally open our doors again we'll be offering little insights for you to come and have a look Great. So back to a few fly questions now. So Matthias asks, what's the longest living fly? Oh, it's so called a sleep... a very good one. <laughs> oh, well, this, this is called the sleeping coronamid. I love <laughs> this. This fly uh, is it's another one of those non-biting midges. It can go to sleep for 13 years. 
How cool is that? And what is amazing about these sleeping coronamids is we're using them to think about how we can do space travel. And that is a genius idea. So they're looking at how the body basically goes into stasis and whether we can actually start to look at how we can go into status. So, you know, it's what, seven years to get to Mars, something like that, isn't it? And they're thinking, well, actually, if we can knock ourselves out, if I just go for a really long sleep, big hibernation, that'd be brilliant. So you've got these really, really long, long sleeping uh, larvae, which are cool. Amazing, yeah, and that partly answers Toby Howard's question about, about what other ways does research about flies help medicine. But I think there's a few other huh, examples where of where do we I remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, flies are the most important organism on the planet, and you'll be like, eh? And it's one fly in particular, and it's called Drosophila melanogaster. Okay, it's a long Latin name, sorry, but this is the one that we've been studying for genetics for over 100 years. So all our knowledge about inherited diseases and all things like that has come from this one little fly that basically got attracted into a lab and a banana in the first place, and that's history. Now, what is amazing about this fly, not only does it help us with behavior and genetics, it's been going into space for over 70 years now. We have made little spaceships to take flies into space. I love this. It was the first animal in space in 1947, and it's been going going up ever since. In fact, they're up there at the moment in the International Space Station. So you know every time it flies over, just get a little wave to the flies. And we're using it to understand again what it's like for us to be in space because their genetics is so similar to ours. And so we can see when they they have uh, when their body cells start to disintegrate, when they degenerate because of living up in space in a different gravity that we're used to. So we look at all of the impacts so they're really really useful to Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so um, Aaron, age 10, asks how you can how you can investigate flies at home. <sighs> OK, uh, you just have to look. Uh, the, the lovely thing about flies is there's so many in your garden. Absolutely so many. Um, I have a time. I have a little garden. I live in South London, but I have a pond. I'm a messy gardener, so I have piles of rubbish everywhere. I have a compost heap. I have everything you need to attract the flies. So uh, I have beautiful flowers in the summer. Um, I, have lot, I have a little vegetable patch as well. And so I can see them hovering around. Now, a lot of you will have mobile phones nowadays and the phones are so good. The cameras are so good. You can get images that you can identify from. Even if you can't do it, there's like lots of applications called like things like iNaturalist where it help you with identifications and things like that. So you could just observe them. I sit there playing with the pond, looking at all the flies on top of it. And the males are all flirting in the next couple of months. And you'll see them massively waving their wings around and things like that. So it's really good fun to just sit and stare at a pond. That's amazing. So someone's asked, would you recommend that people start by studying hoverflies? Yeah. And you know what? Hoverflies are really nice because hoverflies are quite easy. A lot of them are easy to identify through photographs. And also it's they just have some really fun life cycles. So there's one that's turning up at the moment called the marmalade hoverfly. And what's really interesting, if you're in the UK, some of these might have been from Africa. So they will travel vast distances to get to us to help out lots of things. Some of them will grow up in the UK. Some will grow up in Africa and they're all party going on in your garden and so these are the feeds so you can watch them eat <laughs> it's terrible sorry but it's quite fun uh but other ones will the larvae live in your compost bins so they've got really long breathing tube called rat tail maggots so what you could do is you could make your own hoverfly lagoon so you can make your own decomposing disgusting environment to let them live and then you could beautiful adults emerge in a couple of months, a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, so, oh yes, someone's asked how you can attract more flies to your garden. Flowers, local flowers, make sure you get plants that are, are, are native to your environment, the likes of that, because they're going to be used to that. If you get lots of ornamental flowers, a lot of them won't recognise them. They won't recognise the stars, it won't, so they may, weirdly starve 
because the pollen is not right for them. So you've got to be able to get some local plants in. As I said, compost. Everybody loves a bit of decomposing compost. Um, you can have, I have broken pots. So broken pots and things like that. These are offer little refuges for the larvae to live in and things like that. Because a lot of them like dank soil environments. So you need that. Um, I have lavender bushes. I have uh, forget-me-nots. Now, my garden, I love that because that's what gets the bee fly adults going. So it's all very exciting. Also, I'm quite lazy at mowing the lawn. And this is a very important factor because it enables all the ground bees to get in, which the little bee flies, their, their larvae eat their larvae. It's quite grim, but most entertaining. Mm -hmm. Your garden sounds quite like my uh, <laughs> grown mostly for the flies. <laughs> I, uh, my okay. neighbours are very, very good because my neighbours <laughs> love it because they like they see me just staring and they're like, "What have you seen?" And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, it's a really important, really rare species." And they're like, "Okay." <laughs> uh, uh, we've still got a few more minutes if you're happy to answer a few more Go questions, ahead. Erica. Yeah. Yep. So actually, on the question on the um, topic of uh, rare flies, we've had a couple of people ask if there are endangered flies. Yes. Yes, there are. I mean, in much the way that all insects are quite endangered at the moment due to things like habitat loss and land use change. And as we understand more climate change, the flies are going to be endangered as well. And the thing is, we know less about flies than we do a lot of the other species. And this is a really sad thing. But even in the UK, with those 7000 species, a lot of them, we don't know what their larvae are. We don't know where their larvae live. So we have very little information. And this is really sad. For example, in Scotland, there's a fly that's only found there. And it lives in a tiny restricted area that was going to be a golf course. And luckily that has stopped now. And everyone's like, well, why should we save the fly? And it's, uh, well, the fly has every much as right to be here as a panda. And in many ways, I much prefer it over panda. So we have rare species everywhere. There's this fly that is called the terrible hairy fly because it's hairy. I don't know why it's called terrible though. And it lives on bat poo in a cave in Kenya. And that's all. They're probably the most endangered animal on the planet is a fly that lives in the stomach of a rhinoceros. So its habitat is very rare. Rhinos are really rare. So when the rhinos go, this fly will die out. So there's many examples of endangered species. But if you look on the World Endangered Species list, only six species of fly are on it. So we haven't got as much information about them. Uh, still more work to do with uh, yes, fly conservation. Yes, lots there. of work, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I've had a, I'm sitting here shivering a bit because I forgot to put my heater on. And then there's a couple of questions about how flies deal with cold, uh, which are nice and topical. So one is um, what are their minimum temperatures and can they survive in Antarctica? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, you name it. It's purely Eric, I lost you briefly then. Animal in it's a thought of the cold. <laughs> I could add there that some insects have antifreeze in them, and that's what um, helps them in the cold. Oh, we've lost Erica. She's oh gone. dear, was... we've lost her. Yes, we have <laughs> in the cold. <laughs> oh, how sad. Oh, hopefully she'll make it back in. Ah, Hello. There you go. we lost Hello. you. <laughs> You're back. Um, oh, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I needed. Yeah, Helen just said about the anti threes. I could hear all you, which is really annoying. I'm like, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, yes, uh, flies, some flies have anti threes. So they're able to go to ridiculous temperatures. In fact, we've put them in liquid nitrogen and they've survived. Which is, that is what, minus two, I didn't, well, it's, well, it's minus 80, but some have just uh, managed to survive for a couple of seconds and minus 250 degrees centigrade, which is bonkers. Um, some of them um, will, they, they do it by various different methods, but they are, they are amazing in their ability to survive the cold. Plus, also, some of them do the other extreme. So some of them live in petroleum pits and some of them live in like 100 degrees centigrade. It's just absolutely bonkers. So we are at five o'clock now in UK time and 
Thank you. So sorry we haven't got through all the questions. We've had so many coming in. But thank you so much, Erica. That was a fantastic talk. And I hope everyone out there enjoyed it. And uh, thank you again for the Royal Entomological Society for hosting us today. And hopefully we can have some more joint events in the future. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to click end very soon. So bye bye all. Bye bye. bye. That was so much fun. Well done, Erica. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye bye. <laughs>